All right. Hello, guys. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk, to my TED talk. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it was, that, it was one of those. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about security. It's not going to be a deeply technical talk. It's more like to discuss what it means to apply these new concepts of security we're seeing all over the show uh, this, this couple of days to the embedded world. Um, what does it mean, you know, to 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 migrate to these new new ways of thinking about software development and software management, right? Just a quick introduction. Over at Pantacore, we basically do container technology for the embedded for embedded systems, right? We we try to push, you know, we have a, a, all of our customers are people who were trying to imagine their next generation architectures of embedded systems, um, trying to figure out how to go from you know legacy monolithic stacks to things that are more modular, faster, more agile, right? easier to manage, easier to evolve over time. Um, and you know there, there's a lot of, of, of ideas out there on what are the best practices to achieve that. Right? Um, but the context of this presentation in particular is not what we do over at Panthacore in particular with containers, but rather how does it how does the, this modern way of, of managing embedded systems have some kind of affectation to the reality of security that, we're, that is becoming more and more important every day, right? Um, so the title of this presentation is Uncovering Software Provenance in Embedded Systems, right? Which reads real nice, <laughs> I think. Um, sounds kind of poetic, right? <laughs> Let's say. Um, what does that mean, right? I mean, so uncovering software provenance in embedded systems. So provenance, right? What is provenance, right? The idea here is that we, at the end of the presentation, I mean, it's not going to be a super long presentation, but we'll have time at the end to have, I think, a good conversation about what maybe you guys see, you know, either at the companies you work with, or if you have customers and you do consultancy work for embedded systems and this kind of things, like what your customers are starting to talk about this. I'll talk from the point of view of the people we work with. Right? So, oh, that's not it, here. So provenance, right? Provenance is interesting, right? It's the, the place of origin of something, right? Um, the, the, somebody put it very nicely, the, the chronology, the chronology of, of ownership of something, right? Like, what, what is the place of origin? Where did it come from, right? What, what am I actually looking at, right? Um, this, is, this is very relevant in the world of software, right? And particularly in the world of open source software, right? Why? Because everything is just a million things stacked on top of each other. A lot of the times we don't even know what it is, you know, most systems are running, you could say, right? Um, and that has become more and more of a trend over the last few years as containers have become ubiquitous in the cloud, for example. Then, you know, we have gone more towards this black box model, right, where it's not clear exactly, you know, it's not that it's not clear, but there are holes, let's say, it leaves, it leaves gaps, right, in, the, in our ability to truly have fully deterministic uh, systems, right? Knowledge of what's running on those systems. Um, for embedded in particular, you know, for embedded in particular, this is, this is interesting, right? If we think about what has happened at the cloud, you know, containers have been great. We've sacrificed, however, um, you know, that sort of security at the, at the point of, of, let's say, of development or point of origin for super fast DevOps. Okay, that works for the cloud. The cloud is much more easy to also, you know, manage if, if there are issues, if there are problems, you know, it's much more ephemeral. It's, it's just fast, right? You can, you can deal with these issues at, at a much higher velocity, right? If you're thinking about the embedded world, however, right, then that's a complete different problem segment, right? I mean, the, the embedded world is not, it's not like the cloud. If a, if a device fails, if a washing machine dies, well, that's problematic, right? It costs $100 to send a technician out, right? You cannot just, you know, turn it off, off and on, right? Like you could do with a with a cloud instance, right? Um, so, you know, and back in the day, right, I mean, embedded used to be very uh, f much simpler, right? It was about more fixed function devices, you know, single purpose, do one thing, do it right, right? Uh, you know, a, a power control system, or, you know, maybe your old thermostat just did one thing, did it right, it wasn't connected, those things were not like all over the cloud and accessible from everywhere, no, no, none of that. Uh, before it was, it was a simpler world, right? that has slowly changed, right? Now, embedded has not moved at the same speed that let's say higher levels of the stack like cloud development have moved, right? So, but now we're sort of starting to enter that world where containers are sort of making a push, making a play in the embedded world, right? Devices are no longer fixed function only, right? 
devices are not, on, not, not, not completely air gapped anymore, right? Things are connected, right? Things are connected. You know, the software stacks are much larger, right? I mean, we're talking about potentially multiple different functions, features inside of a, a unique device, right? Everything is sort of like split around in microservices. It starts to be a little bit more like that. You think, let's say, of a washing machine, right? To go back to the same example then it's no longer just a program, right? Maybe it's a thing that sends a lot of telemetry up, you know, to a cloud somewhere so that the manufacturer can know, you know, wear and tear on the, on the drum, for example. So it can learn about the, the you know, the ways that, that I wash my clothes, like how often do I do it, right? Do I use liquid detergent? Do I use, you know, powder soap, whatever, like all of these things, right? There's a lot, there's a lot more going on, right, in our devices than there was going on 10 years ago or 15 years ago, right? That's great, but you know, it, it, it brings a problem, right? We, we open the door to a lot of, uh, of unknown code, you could say, that is gonna be running on, on devices that uh, it becomes a very complex problem, right? The, the bigger the software stack, the harder it is to keep complete tabs on what's running there, right? On really uncovering that software provenance, right? Ergo the, the name of the talk, right? So what happens, how, how does this affect, you know, how does this play into the security of the, of the embedded world, right? So, security for embedded, and a lot of people will disagree, some will agree, and has always been relevant, but not massively important, right? Has been relevant, but you know, like it's, it's a, a dime a dozen, all kinds of uh, security issues, you know, everybody always has in their mind projects that have failed, things that have been taken over. For example, we're gonna talk later about the last year, the, the colonial pipeline, the ransomware attack that probably screwed a bunch of you guys here in the US. Um, <clears throat> but you know, the, before legacy, like I was saying, legacy embedded systems were monolithic mashups of a ton of software. And it didn't matter that much what you would do there because maybe these things were not connected and so on. And the smaller it was, the easier it was to really understand what was running, right? But now everything is connected, the systems are massive, the surface of attack has multiplied, right? Simple as that, surface of attack has multiplied. And when we talk about IoT devices or smart home or whatever you wanna call it, right? And I'm talking more towards the, the user facing part of the problem, not necessarily you know, uh, an assembly line factory robot, right? But like more user facing things. Um, you know, as things became massively connected, that attack surface massively increased, right? So up to what point is it okay to, to oversee that security problem at the user level, right? Like it, it becomes more and more important to actually make a, let's say, a, 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 you know, provide that confidence to the end user that devices are safe, right? As simple as that, right? Everybody's always worried, you know, everybody of, of you know, having an Alexa in your house is like always listening to you, and so, but that's, that's a decision you made. You wanted to listen to you, it's fine. But what about the other devices you didn't explicitly say, right? Yes, please listen to what I'm saying, right? So, you know, and, and these are tons of them out there, you know, like there's been a million, a million cases of, of children's toys with cameras and so on that get compromised, right, for example, right? So a little pet over pops up over there, right? Um, and then, you know, content finds its way to the dark web and like, you don't want to be that content producer. I mean, that's, that's not the type of influencer you want to be, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so so sh should we be worried about the safety of our data, private information? Of course, right? We're all worried about that, right? We're just not too aware, right? Users are becoming more and more aware now, a little bit more, but more education needs to take place, right? Plenty of big, of big hacks come to, come to mind, right? Um, let me see. But the most important thing, let's say, most relevant thing that has happened over the past couple of years was the Colonial Pipeline uh, ransomware attack uh, last year, May, I think, something like that. Uh, I imagine some of you might be familiar with that if you try to, to load gas during those days. Uh, maybe the, I don't remember if it was the southern states or northern, but it was like 12, 15 states or something like that that were heavily impacted in the, in the, in the gas flow, right? To the east. To the east, okay. Uh, and then, you know, like mass panic ensued, everybody was loading their stuff, so that created shortages, and then price skyrocketed in those states, and it was like, it was down for four or five days, right? Then they ended up paying 75 Bitcoin, it was like four million at the time of writing. Uh, at the time it was actually paid, Bitcoin had crashed, that's another issue, but not the, not the topic of this talk, right? Um, but the point is, you know, they, there was nothing to, right? A critical infrastructure piece of the country failed because of a security issue, right? How do you catch those things before they happen? Okay, after they happen, you're like, okay, well, they took it over, okay, fine, let's do a post-mortem, let's find out what was the vulnerability, let's patch these things, let's figure it out. 
but how do we mitigate ahead of the event, right, the potential vulnerabilities that might be on a trusted pipeline of software, let's say, right, or a known pipeline of software, so that maybe we prevent things like this, right? We see also all the time, you know, how botnets spread all over routers. These are a dime a dozen, they happen every year, you know, like, and sometimes they take down infrastructure. A few years ago, there was, a, not a few years ago, last year there was something with Deutsche Telekom, a bunch of routers went down, right? Okay, that was a botnet that went a little bit haywire, just expanded all over the place, and it just killed the devices. It probably wasn't meant to kill the devices even, just to go in them and actually, well, continue spreading that botnet. The, let's say the Trojan wasn't great, it killed the, the routers, right? In itself, of course, right? but, so, yeah. but it left a lot of people without internet. Deutsche Telekom was sort of dead for a few days, right? Um, and these things are happening more and more and more, right? So how do we mitigate at the point of the vulnerability becoming disclosed or becoming available or, or at, at the point of a security team just finding out that maybe there's a surface of attack over there? And how do we reduce that time gap of action, right? to really prevent the issue from, from escalating to something like this, right? That's, that's the part that is hard, right? So um, the colonial pipeline incident resulted in, in, the, in, the, in the federal government, right? Having a very quick response, they had to say something to figure out, you know, like they had to say, okay, I'm here, I'm gonna fix it, don't worry guys, right? Um, so Biden came out and, and signed the, the, the very famous in the show, the, the Software Bill of Materials Executive Order, right? This was in, in May of last year, about five days after, it was, after the ransom was paid. Um, yeah, May 2021. Five days after the ransomware was paid. An executive order was issued, right? That amongst a bunch of things, right? It basically creates a bit of a, of a framework for which uh, device-centric companies or you know, technology companies have to adhere to if their hardware is in critical parts of the federal government, right? So it doesn't apply to everyone, it doesn't apply to consumer hardware, technically, right? But it's a first step, you know, towards a, and some of you might have even more detail or have, might have read the whole thing top to bottom many times, maybe drafted it, who knows, right? Um, but, you know, one of the key points is in particular this one, right? Uh, the provenance of open source software used within any portion of a product, right? That's usually the hardest part, because if, if you have a product that's 100% proprietary software, you know, um, uh, built for purpose, then you're kind of in control, right? You're kind of in control. You might be screwing up and also creating a bunch of vulnerabilities, but you're in control of that software stack. You know what's coming from where, right? We're talking about open source software, which is now pervasive to every part of everything in our lives, right? We're all using open source software, even if we don't know it. You know that, right? Um, it starts to become important to understand what issues can it bring, right? But the, the, the real issues are the ones that, that you're not even aware that might exist. You're, you, know, you, you might be making, let's say, the colonial pipeline, right? So some control systems that regulate opening and closing, I'm just making this up, right? But you know, that, that might have some old version of some library, let's say OpenSSL, right? And, and maybe that had a vulnerability, but you never thought about that, right? And that thing resulted in some kind of compromised path that actually allowed those guys to take over the entire system or to go back to the, to the scenario of your home, right? Maybe you don't care too much about a washing machine being compromised, right? But at the end of the day, the washing machine is in your home network, right? So maybe that's an attack entry to the rest of your home network. You might have other equipment in your home network, like closed circuit cameras or something that you're like, no, this is air gap, my video is not going out to the internet. But maybe somebody enters your home network through another piece of equipment, like a washing machine that might have a, a little library that was compromised, right? How do you discover these things? Well, uh, it's not enough only to have a software bill of materials. Software bill of materials is great because it lists the components. It gives you at least a, a starting point to try and address the problem, right? But it's not the only, it's, it's not the complete solution, right? It's just the starting point. So what does is, what is SBOMS you know, have to do with embedded IoT? How can we apply some of those concepts? What, what can we take from them, right? So there's a harmful, uh, sorry. A handful, not harmful. <laughs> there, there's a handful of vendors out there that have been creating for the cloud side, you know, code inside, dependency graph and dependency management, you know, dependency discovery uh, uh, tools, basically, to address what it means to create your software bill of materials, right? And they've been connecting that to very interesting systems that allow you to have automated insights, alarms based on vulnerabilities being discovered, right? All these kind of things, how the things work together, right? And really go down to the you know, tiny little details of where might a vulnerability surface to the higher level of your stack, right? Um, 
the cloud has is certain the cloud is always a little bit let's say more advanced in the adoption of this sort of like forward looking technologies right that doesn't mean that they cannot apply to embedded too however right um, now the thing remember what I said at the beginning uh, historically embedded has always been about monolithic systems right systems that are a mashup of features right that is not very modular not very agile not, not very easy for you to understand the blocks that make it up right as we go into uh, a more, let's say, advanced future for embedded as well, right, then embedded starts to adopt some of this container technology. Right? So we can leverage some of what has been done in the cloud to you know, have, a, have the way to, to, to get ahead of these issues, of some of these issues, vulnerabilities popping up, right? not, not after, not after the, the pipeline has been taken over, but before. Right? So, um, so at the end of the day, you know, we, we can consume some of these technologies, and if we mix this up with interest in, let's say, well, software management techniques, um, you know, distributed architecture for modular software delivery, these kind of things, then we can start connecting the dots and, and being a little bit more secure ahead of the potential event, right? For example, there's this guy's, uh, one of the logos I showed, Rivenira, right? I, you know, I've been looking at these guys for, for some of the projects we're doing with some customers, and this is interesting, right? Basically, there's an inventory of the software that makes up each one of the software components, right? They, they don't deal directly with containers, but if you have a component list, for example, your main data software bill of materials, if you're, let's say, contracting with the federal government, right, then it's easy to plug that into this thing, right, and give you alerts, give you vulnerabilities as they come, as they, as they surface through any of the security channels, any new CVE that touches this, this, or that. Okay, well, there's a system. All of that is indexed. All of that goes into a very beautiful, nice database, API-driven. You can connect it to any system, right? So as you start having this kind of tools, right, then it becomes much easier to connect it to, to downstream software management pipelines, right? The same way that you would do on the cloud, right? If you had this connected to, you know, to, to let's say, cloud infrastructure, then you could very easily flag containers that actually have those part of the components. That's what Snake and, and these other guys do for actual Docker containers and the like, right? You connect those two things, you can very quickly say, um, you know, application A, B, C, whatever, at, at this service deployment or deployment level are vulnerable for this, this, and that, right? Those alarms could be raised. But we could go even one step further, right? On the embedded world is really, as I remember what I said before, if a, if a cloud server gets compromised, at best, you're going to have data that you might end up with data loss, but you know, if, you, if you're doing your things right, maybe it's not data loss, maybe it's just you know, downtime for the service, let's call it, right? Um, but the Colonial Pipeline, <laughs> that one, there's no way you can just fix it, right? If it's gone, it's gone, right? So we can connect these things with the software lifecycle management tools, with the, so, um, uh, with the software updates, software delivery mechanisms we have, right? And maybe do instantaneous mitigation of some kind, right? These are all ideas, of course, of, of what can happen in the future. Like, we're, we're not doing any of this. Well, I mean, we are with some, with some customers exploring this because they're beginning to ask about it, right? These are customers that before maybe didn't care too much about it. They just thought it's okay to just have a security team and they'll sort of keep an eye out on things and then we'll see what happens, right? But it's becoming more complex, right? So they're starting to think, okay, what can we do what, to think, to think of security as part of the architecture early on, right? Not as an afterthought, right? Security after the fact is always wrong, right? Um, so, so this is, this is what I was just saying, right? So what if we start to automate some of those systems, right? If we start to take the, the smart insights from code, from, from dependency management and so on, maybe we can start to do the determination at the origin versus the mitigation during runtime, right? We might be able to, to determine quickly when something comes and try to mitigate it on the runtime with automated tools, right? You might be able to bring down parts of the service yourself, right? You might be able to bring down the, let's say again, Colonial Pipeline, bring down the, the delivery of gas yourself before it became vulnerability that somebody else could do for the complete ransomware attack. So you might kill it so that you can fix it, for example, but that might happen automatically, right? It might be something that just air gaps the thing and says, no, it's off the internet, it's off whatever, right? We'll go and fix it now, right? That prevents, of course, somebody else taking over the system, right? So that's automatic mitigation or risk management, you could say, right? Um, like we said before, as opposed to cloud, you know, real hardware cannot fail, right? So this is not a, you know, like there is no, no room for error with this, right? You have to be better every time. No other answer, right? Um, 
Also, we have to deal with this kind of thing, right? User level tampering of a device is always a possibility, right? We cannot get too much ahead of that, but we can identify it, right? If something happened and software changed on the device, we can probably identify it, right? We can identify it. There's all kinds of technologies for this nowadays, right? Security verification, secure boot, root of trust, you know, signatures, whatever you want to call it. There's all kinds of tools for that, right? So we can connect all those things to have a really automated way of managing this problem, right? So Signing software, of course, is, is, is nothing new, right? But the, mo the most important part, right, is maintaining trust across the entire software, right? Remember what we said before. We have, we, have, we have all the systems that can give us alarms when new vulnerabilities come to the table, right? But we also have to be able to have a very strict, let's say, um, enforceable uh, model for our device software to always be considered um, correct, to be trusted, right? So Embedded is starting to leverage a lot of those tools. Our move to, mo to modular, to containerization, there are several companies that are doing containers for Embedded now, are leveraging these kind of tools. Everything is signed, everything is tested, everything is a root of trust, or a very nice chain of verification, right? This is nothing new, but it's actually, it wasn't there before too much, right? Uh, at the best, you had some signatures of complete software stacks and things like that, but it was, it, it was a little, let's say, lazier. Not everyone did it. Right, as simple as that, not everyone did it, right? Not everybody had the, well, the skills, the budget, whatever it was, right, to, to really go that deep into the trust uh, and to maintaining the trust of the entire vertical staff of, of, embedded, of embedded devices, right? Um, so as we move into containers, well, an immutable software payload is much easy um, to become deterministic from the point of view of trust. Like, it's much easier to validate, to verify if that immutable container or whatever is what you expect it to be, right? And also to identify if that container has any of those vulnerabilities we mentioned before, you connect into any of those pipelines, Riveneer, Sneak, any of those guys, then you can identify, right? And you can identify which devices of your device fleet might be susceptible, might be at risk, right? What, it, what might be at risk? So we do automatic mitigation, right? Um, let's see here. So in our company, Pentacore, what we do, I mean, we, we, we take a view of of defining the, the entire state um, with, a, with a very deterministic document that just outlines everything that is on the system. Right? With that, we can cross-reference with what the sources of those things can be from a container point of view or you know, kernel trees where it was built, all these kind of things. Right? Um, we call this you know, state revisions. Um, it is our answer not to the problem, but it's just how we lay out systems in our world and how we introduce a degree of security and trust to those customers that work with us, right? It is by no means, you know, a one panacea that will fix anything. No, not at all. All I'm saying is that, you know, for the people we work with, well, we try to create the security trust pipelines based on this type of solutions, right? Um, so, so as we said before, you know, verification of software is nothing new. We take a view that um, in our world, embedded systems should all be very modular, like software should always be delivered as immutable payloads. Everything can be very measured, very connected one to the other in a pipeline of trust, right? Um, our, our technology to achieve this, of course, is called Pantavisor. That's beyond the point. Um, we basically deliver containers and have everything signed from a very nice root of trust. This is just your normal secure boot type of implementation. But because of this, we have a view of what every device in the field is running at each container level. So it can be connected to those systems where the provenance of that software might raise the right flags to help you mitigate those problems before they happen, right? Um, so I don't think there's a complete solution to this problem yet. Like the, the whole embedded market hasn't really landed into we're going to do things this way or that way. But I think, and you can probably see that in the, in the show floor upstairs, there's so much investment in, 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 in dependency graphing and code insights, right? There, like, there's like 15 startups over there that have a lot of money in the pockets, right? And they're trying to solve that problem for the cloud. So let's use that. Let's use that for embedded, right? Let's use the same technology to deploy software, and let's apply the same concepts to keep that software secure, to keep those devices secure, right?
this is exactly what we were saying just now, right? So vulnerability alarms coming up from your bill of materials checks, right? The orchestrator identified vulnerable devices. Maybe it mitigates by turning some parts of the software off, right? Or taking the entire device off the network for a while, right? Th these, are, these are things that, you know, we, we're doing a, a subset of that. This is more like what is the idea towards the future, right? Right now, the most we do at the moment is, is flag some of these potentially vulnerable containers and then, you know, you pass that on to the security team of the customer, right? It's available for them to do whatever they want. But, you know, in my mind, I think, well, we could connect that to, to much more automated systems, right? We work a lot, for example, with router, uh, with, um, with CPs, home gateways, and basically telco, right? And, you know, like, how much money, the amount of money you can save at telco if you can prevent that botnet from spreading before it happens, right? That's ridiculous, right? I mean, it's, it's really important stuff, right? So we should be much smarter, we should be much better at this, think about this problem, have more conversations like this, right? And just, well, find how to start mitigating those problems, right? Um, so embedded can and must address this, like it says over there at the end, right? It is not just the, the job of the cloud to keep data secure, no, it is the job of embedded to keep those devices that we put so much trust in secure, right? I don't want my house to be compromised, I don't want my gas to go away, right? And that's it, right? So that's actually my final slide. <laughs> the whole point of this is to, to trigger a bit of a, of a conversation or a thought process in your own heads later, not necessarily now, but just think about it, right? Because it's important, right? There's a lot of work being done that is just, there's a lot of embedded equipment that is still built in the way that it was done 15, 20 years ago, right? It's just, just kind of throw away or just mash up of things and, and now those things are getting connected. It's a huge risk, right? We've been seeing that huge risk for the past few years. I don't think we've, 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 we've seen the worst of, 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 the, of the backfiring that that creates, right? We've seen some of these scenarios, but I think we're gonna see a lot more, right? Because everybody talks about IoT, everybody talks about everything getting connected, your house getting super smart, but the truth is that most of you don't have their, their house full of smart stuff, right? But, you know, the next, the next washing machine you buy two, three years from now will be connected, right? Everything is going to be connected from that point of view. Not necessarily, oh, it's super smart, it has big screens or anything. No, but it's connected. It's sending some telemetry. It's taking updates, right? It's maybe not connected to the user itself. You don't see it as a, as a super smart device, but it's certainly connected. Your network can be compromised. Everything can be compromised from any one of those entry points, right? So it's a big problem, and we have to start thinking about it. So thank you for that. Um, uh, you know, let's discuss. If you guys have any questions or just want to bring ideas to the table, right? Happy to chat. <laughs> Well, I mean, so that's the thing. So if you, if there, are, there are two concepts that, depending on who you ask, they will give you a different answer. Right? What is IoT or what is embedded, right? Um, you know, the reality embedded is everything that is not general purpose. Let's call it that way, right? Um, and the same applies to IoT. Nobody really knows what IoT is. IoT just means something that is connected, is my definition of it. If something is connected, you could consider it to be IoT. It might be a little microcontroller-based sensor, or it might be a huge server somewhere. I'll call it IoT. It's connected to a network, it's available, it's reachable, right? Um, so to, to your question there, what I'm talking about here applies more to higher level stacks, right? So, so, um, so the, the, you could say the, the embedded that is bigger, the embedded that is not microcontroller based, right? So the embedded that is actually embedded Linux based, right? Things that are a little bit more complex, multi-feature devices, right? Things that are not only fixed uh, function. I was talking about the washing machine, right? Why was I talking about the washing machine? It's a good example. Washing machines 10 years ago, or five years ago, three years ago, you know, 99% of them were just very simplistic microcontroller-based systems. Turn this on, turn that off, some power control, that's it. Next generations are moving a lot of those functions to, uh, to higher compute capacity devices, things that are actually running full-fledged operating systems, a little embedded Linux board, right? So these problems start to become apparent over there because now the features are sort of being split, right, in ways that it becomes harder and harder to maintain that, that entire confidence in the system, right? So no, it's not about microcontrollers, although that's important too, right? But it's, it's a, let's say, it's a less complex or, or less big, right, problem to address if we're talking about a, a, a fixed feature microcontroller based device, right? Does that answer your question a little bit? Or at least that's my, my way of thinking. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're talking about higher level 
Yes, yes, higher level stuff. I mean, we're talking about higher level stuff, so we're talking about Linux stuff, right? Embedded Linux stuff, something that can run Linux, but we're not, I'm not talking, to, or at least what we do at Pantacore, we don't, we don't work with higher level like embedded devices. Like we don't, we're not really into the, the Raspberry Pi Plus parts of the world. We're rather towards a slightly lower parts of the world. We're talking about devices that are 16, 32 megabytes of NOR flash, 64 megabytes of NAND flash. I mean, the, the core of what we do is containerization for those low spec devices, right? But you know that, that's the that's the problem segment we have observed. I'm sure there's bigger things out there and maybe other ways to to address those problems. But at least in our problem segment, well, that's that's what it looks like. <laughs> Any other insights or? Yeah? It's a fantastic question that maybe somebody else in the audience can answer. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, if, if you have a, a complete compromise at the root of trust of the device, be it a tube device or something, a TPM, whatever, like wh whatever that, that root of trust is, well, I don't know if there's an easy way to mitigate that. Maybe somebody else knows. Exactly. And that, that brings in the place of mitigation ahead of the problem, right? You, you maybe, you might flag something's weird there, cut it off, right? Type of thing, type of mitigation strategies, right? Um, yeah? I was going to say, um, there's the concept of the arm trust, which is known, mm -hmm. that only certain parts, right? only certain functions can access certain memory regions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so there's a million ways. The, the, the problem about security is that it's not a complete problem, right? I mean, it's, it goes in all possible directions. And those, there's all kinds of technologies out there that help you mitigate parts of this problem. Like Ricardo was saying, I mean, you can do attestation if the problem is a compromised root of trust. You can certainly do that. You can have little, you know, you can have trust and mediated access to particular memory regions or subsystems or, or buses inside the system, whatever it might be. That, nothing is a panacea, however. I mean, the, the, the most important thing is try to, Try to identify those vulnerabilities before they're exploited from a central point of view, right? It's not, try to identify what has been compromised, what might be vulnerable, right? And then enact some policies to address that. That's also not going to fix everything, right? But it's, it's at the very least important for us as the architects of that sort of next generation, right? To think about that while we architect those next generation devices, right? It's important, right? Yep. No, they, they are in use. I mean, again, it, it once again depends on the industry. Some industries just don't have the budget for that. As simple as that, low cost stuff. But if you go to higher cost stuff, which is still deeply embedded, then you will start finding uh, roots of trust. I mean, a, a root of trust is not necessarily a TPM. A TPM is actually a, a huge component that provides a lot of features, right? But you might have a little TUF type of thing that's just a, a, a very static root of trust, right? I mean, there's all levels of things you can do, right? We are seeing it more pervasive. I mean, it becomes more, uh, more available, let's say, and, and just like your colleague next to you was talking about, well, ARM Trust Zone is available in most SOCs, right? <laughs> yeah, and they have virtual Exactly. Right. But you know, but not everybody leverages. We work with a lot of customers that, you know, they could leverage Trust Zone, for example, but they don't care, right? <laughs> Simple as that, right? It, it falls sometimes to us to try and evangelize a little bit the importance of it, right? But in their mind, it's like, hmm, it's okay. Even though there's no extra cost, well, I mean, there's no extra bomb cost. There might be an extra software cost, right, for the development or, or, or implementation of, of, of that. But the embedded world also suffers from the fact that it's very fast paced. Everybody, everyone always needs to get a new, a new version of their hardware out there, right? So, you know, it's, it's, 
it's a complicated segment, but the tools are available. And again, it's up to us to, to, to educate right, those product engineering teams on what are potential best practices for the future. Right? All right, I think that's it. Let's not take more time from the previous speaker. I think we're five from the time, so good. Thank you for coming, guys. If you want to know a little bit more about what we do, you can go to booth B33 at the sponsorship floor. Thank you.